<laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again so much. So um, without further ado, Dr. Lori Bennett. Yeah. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here um, for this great presentation and this great moment. I want to take a second before we um, get started to just introduce a couple people in the audience who have come to hear our speaker, Ms. Dolores Huerta. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge that one of our trustees, trustee Magdalena Gomez, is here with us today. Thank you, Magdalena, for joining us. And she is the goddaughter of Ms. Huerta. Um, I'd also like to say welcome to Dr. Angel Reyna, who is the president of Badera College, and Dr. Goldsmith, who is the president of Fresno City College. So thank you so much for joining us today. And now I'd like to introduce our very special guest, Dolores Huerta. Um, Dr. Huerta, or Dolores Huerta, is a legendary labor leader women's advocate and civil rights activist who co-founded the United Farm Workers um, UFW. Her mother's independence and entrepreneurial spirit was one of the primary reasons that Dolores became a feminist. Working alongside with Pre UFW President Cesar Chavez, Dolores was involved in numerous community and labor organizing efforts in Central California and quickly became a skilled organizer and negotiator for the union. In the UFW, she was instrumental in the union's many successes, including the strikes against California grape growers in the 1960s and 70s, and as an advocate for farm workers' rights, she was arrested 22 times for participating in nonviolent civil disobedience activities and strikes. Dolores stepped down from her position at the UFW in 1999, yet she continues to work to improve the lives of workers, immigrants, women, and children. As founder and president, of the Dolores Huerta Foundation. She travels across the country, engaging in campaigns and influencing legislation that supports equality and defends civil rights. Dolores has received numerous awards and honors for her activism and community service, including the Eleanor Roosevelt Human Rights Award, the Puffin Foundation's Award for Creative Citizenship, the Ellis Island Medal of Freedom Award, the Smithsonian Institution's James Smithson Award, and in 2012, President Obama bestowed Dolores with her most prestigious award, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian award in the United States. Please help me welcome the Honorable Dolores Huerta. Thank you very much, Dr. Bennett, uh, for that uh, nice introduction, beautiful introduction. And I want to thank the other uh, presidents of colleges that are joining us. And also, of course, Magdalena Gomez. Uh, Magdalena could probably give this lecture herself, OK? So uh, you might want to put her on the agenda for future lectures if you already have it, because uh, she grew up in the movement. Uh, her father uh, was one of the, our great, great organizers. Uh, in the United Farm Workers and a really beautiful example of people that come from the grassroots and become great leaders. And uh, so, and, and her brother, by the way, is also uh, quite active in the, in the Democratic Party. I believe he's the head of the Central Committee uh, here in, in the San Joaquin Valley for the Democratic Party. So it, it's, uh, they're a really good example about uh, when a family pickets together, they stay together, okay? <laughs> and they're all involved in the movement. And, you know, we have, uh, we're celebrating so many uh, events here in March right now. Uh, we know that we are celebrating Cesar Chavez's birthday, which is going to be coming up on the 31st of March. Uh, we are celebrating Women's History Month and all of the achievements of women and uh, right, you know, and where we have to go from here. Uh, last year, we celebrated the 100 years that women got the right to vote. And of course, I think we're all celebrating vaccinations. <laughs> so. When, when we have this event in the future, we'll all be able to do it in person. 
And so I think, you know, we're, we have a lot of things to celebrate and we are seeing that there is a lot of hope at the end of the tunnel. And I do want to thank every, all the other folks that have come in and are going to be with us today. And we have so much to talk about because so many things are going on right now. Uh, we are in a very critical moment, you might say, in the history of the United States. Uh, as you mentioned, Dr. Bennett, you know, I am going to be 91 years old uh, in a couple of weeks uh, uh, on April the 10th. And uh, since I, you know, I, I was born uh, during the Depression and uh, grew up uh, as a, I was a young child after the Depression. And, but it's really interesting, every, every time that we've had some great uh, chaotic moment in our country, the great things have come out of it. After the Depression, of course, uh, that is when uh, they started the labor movement, where workers were given the right to organize into unions under the, the National uh, Labor Relations Act. We saw after World War II, for instance, that uh, they were given the, the GIs, uh, the ex-soldiers, uh, the right to go to college free. And not only that, but a lot of women uh, for the first time were able to go into the workplace after World War II. Yeah, so we know that coming out of uh, what we have been going through now uh, with the pandemic, that some, thing, some good things are going to come out of this uh, also, but we, we just have to uh, be open-minded and ready to accept the changes. And not only that, but maybe involve self, ourselves in some of the changes that, that we, we know that need to, need to happen. Uh, and by the way, I just uh, want to thank all of the folks out there who are on marches and protests uh, for the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the movements that we started here uh, in the United States with Black Lives Matter went all over the, all over the world. And so we saw that people were protest, protesting and asking for an end to racism, you know, in, in, our, in our world, because this is something, of course, that people of color have been suffering uh, for centuries. But now we see that there is an open cry. Yes, we want, we need to end racism. Uh, because as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, racism is a sickness. And this is something that needs to be cured. And of course, we, all of us, have to think of ourselves of being the healers of how we're going to end racism. And of course, one of the ways that we do this, as I mentioned, the protests and the way the women got the vote, of, of, of course, is by organizing. But, but when I say that, people think, well, that's kind of, what, it, what does that really mean? And it's really interesting that uh, it, throughout our history, that when people try to organize and they come together, there is are repercussions you know, and uh, 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 people try to break up their organizations. Uh, it happened to us with the United Farm Workers. Uh, when we farm workers were organizing for, to get some really simple basic needs that they had, like toilets in the field. And when Magdalena, Magdalena's father and, and, and her grandmother, when they were farm workers, they didn't have toilets in the fields. And you can imagine what that was like for the women, especially, but even the men. I mean, the fact that you know that the, those crops that are being picked out there in the fields are gonna go straight to your, to, to your grocery store and people weren't even given the, the minimal hygienic things that they needed, soap and water to wash their hands, you know? Uh, and, and not given, given cold water in the hot sun or rest periods or the right to organize or even have unemployment insurance when the harvest ended. And this is why they were called migrants because when the harvest ended, they had to go to another place, uh, to another place where, there were, uh, where, where, where crops had to be picked or planted, whatever. And uh, it, it took a long time to be able to get those benefits. And, and farm workers did not get those benefits until they came together and they organized. And then of course they had to go on strike and they did all these marches, et cetera. And it wasn't of course until we did the national boycott uh, to get 17 million Americans to stop eating grapes. Basically the farm workers went out there and they talked to churches and community groups and labor unions uh, to get people to support them. And they did because we know the people of good conscience in our country that they care about people. So, and, and we see this attack on people when they try to organize, for instance, the young people, when they were organizing against the Vietnam War. And, and we can really, really, really give them credit because it was all of these young people that kept uh, marching in opposition to the Vietnam War that they finally ended the war. But in, 
in the process of doing that, they had young people that were killed, you know, uh, and of course, many were beaten in the marches. And there's a movie that I want to refer you to. It just came out. It's called The Chicago, The Chicago Seven. And it's a story about Tom Hayden and Bobby Seale, uh, who was with the Black Panthers, that, uh, that they were uh, the, they actually arrested them for doing the protests that they were doing. And it, it's a really interesting movie about the Chicago Seven. But it also shows the kind of brutality that that students were met with. As we have seen also, this, many of the young people that were marching, and not just young ones, there were older ones too, that were marching on the Black Lives Matter movement, how the police beat them up. So we've always had that the uh, people that are trying to oppress others, how they keep them from organizing. They try to keep them from organizing. That's why organizing is so important. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, about how the very basic steps uh, that Cecil Chavez and myself and other organizers learned about how to organize people. Uh, because we know that one of the problems that we have uh, in organizing is apathy. And people, often they have self-doubts and uh, they don't realize that they, that they can organize. But we know, especially you know, in everything that's happened, we can say in the last, uh, I'm, I'm gonna start with January the 6th, on the insurrection uh, against uh, our capital of the United States of America. Well, um, in that case, you did have people that were organizing, but kind of contrast this, there's been a couple of hundred people that have been charged uh, with, the, with, their, with their attack on the, on the capital of the United States of America. When the Black Lives Matter movement was marching in Washington, D.C., a peaceful protest, okay? Not a violent uh, insurrection like what the folks that attacked the Capitol. So you had about 3,000 of them that were arrested and charged. But the people that attacked the Capitol with guns and you know people that were actually killed on that attack on a US Capitol, so you have about a couple of hundred of them that have been charged, okay? So we see again the differences of, uh, because of racism. And we know that this is something that we definitely definitely have to get rid of, you know. As I said before, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that racism is a sickness and we have to be the healers. Well, one of the ways that we can start the, oh, by the way, I, you know, and we do know that the outcomes of racism uh, are what happened uh, in, in uh, recently in, in Georgia where Asian women were killed. Well, in that case, not only because they were women, but actually they were Asian also. And we see that, you know, Mexicans were killed in El Paso, Texas, because they were Mexicans. That Jewish people were killed in a synagogue because they're Jews. And of course, black people in the church because they're black. So we know that this, we've got to stop the hatred in our country. And of course, one of the ways that we can do this, and since we're speaking at a community college here, is with education. Now, luckily, our, in California, our State Board of Education has just uh, voted that they will be having ethnic studies in our high schools, and it will be mandatory. And Governor Newsom has also allocated some funding. I'm sure that the legislature will approve it so we can train teachers. And we all assume that, well, teachers know but I'm gonna tell you a little story. <laughs> Once when I was in Oregon and one of the university professors was giving me a ride to the airport. And he said to me, I wonder why they have so many Spanish names uh, in cities uh, in California. And I thought this is a university professor, okay? <laughs> Does he not know that before 1848, a uh, one third of the United States was Mexico. And as we know, California was Mexico and Arizona and Texas and, you know, parts of Colorado, you know. So uh, I, I think when we think of ethnic studies, it's so, so important. And I say to people, look at a map of the United States before 1848 and you will see that and it's shocking when you see how much of the United States was Mexico. And so when they tell people of Mexican descent, like myself, go back where you came from, we can say we are where we came from, okay? And we were here before the United States was the United States of America. We were here first. 
And I think it also applies to all of the indigenous people uh, from all of our continents of North and South America. So when you think about who the real immigrants were that came to the United States, it was the people from Europe. They are the real immigrants of the United States. And we have to constantly remind all of the white supremacists out there that this country was brown when the immigrants from Europe arrived here because of the indigenous people in our United States. So the other thing that's really important to end racism once and for all, we constantly have to remind people that we are one human race, one human race. We have a lot of different cultures. We have a lot of different ethnic groups. We have a lot of different nationalities, but we only have one human race. And our scientific name for our human race is Homo sapiens. And we know as our human race traveled from Africa where we originated and went across our planet that you know people got lighter in skin, people had different color of eyes, different color of hair. But you know, this this organ, this organ that we have, our human organ called the skin, yeah, it's of different colors, but inside every single organ that we have is the same color. <laughs> so we have to constantly remind people of that. And I'd like to say that we are all related. If we were all together right now, I would say to you, take the hand of the person next to you, turn to them and say, hello, relative. Hello, relative. And we know that the only way that we survived on earth is because we had to take care of each other. We had to support each other, protect each other, share our resources with each other. If not, we would not have survived on planet earth because we had other primates, primates that were much bigger and stronger than us. But that is how we survived by being organized and taking care of each other. So we can say to folks out there on the KKK, uh, the neo-Nazis, the Proud Boys, all of you white supremacists out there, just get over it because you are also Africans, okay? So take that home to your dinner conversation, by the way. Take that home to your dinner conversation with your family and help them share it. And the other thing, uh, as we go and become healers against uh, to eliminate racism, oh, by the way, we also should only use the word race when it is attached to human, human race. That's the only way that we should use it. Otherwise, let's use the word ethnic group, okay? Let's remember that in our writings and everything that we do, race is only attached to human, human race. Because we know that racism is a, a, a construction that came out of the out of slavery, and, and and so people would look down on the indigenous people who were the first slaves before people were brought in from Africa, and the fact that people slavery means that we want people to work for nothing, and to make other people rich with their energy, that they with our energy that we have, and of course that also then goes on to women and to children that somehow we should work for free. And this is why uh, labor unions are important because we know that labor unions are again, an organization, an organization of workers so they can protect themselves on the job in the state legislature and in the, in the Congress of the United States of America. And labor unions are very important because they create the middle class and without a middle class uh, you know, they also create the de a democracy, right? Without a middle class, we do not have a democracy in the United States. So that is why labor unions are very, very important, an important institution in, in our country. So we have to do everything that we can to end slavery. And the other thing is, of course, I talked about women, okay, how this slavery also, uh, the whole uh, tradition of slavery also is, uh, you know, it's a way that women are affected also. So when we talk about our educational system, so we have to have ethnic studies, labor studies, and yes, women's studies also, okay? <laughs> because again, we talk about, the, I mentioned the fact that the Asian women that were killed uh, because they were women. And, and we know that every single day, you know, even as we are 
here right now today that somewhere a woman is getting beaten, a woman is getting raped, a woman is getting murdered because someone thinks that they own the woman's body or they have control over that woman's body. So it's important that we start teaching uh, little boys in kindergarten and first grade that little girls are equal and they need to be respected. So hopefully we can end that, the sexism and the misogyny in our cultures also. And by the way, as I mentioned about women, I do want to say that right now in the US Congress, uh, there is a bill called the Equal Rights Amendment. And we are one of the few countries in the world that have not signed on to the Equal Rights Amendment, okay? And so we want to ask everybody to be sure and uh, send letters to your senators or people that you know in other states to vote for the Equal Rights Amendment. It will be part of the Constitution of the United States. So we can actually make history by making sure that the United States and the US Senate ratifies the Equal Rights Amendment for women. And I'll talk a, a, about that a little bit more. So, and when we talk about uh, what we also need, of course, we, when we talk about women's studies, we need to talk also about gender studies. And, uh, and you know, it's oftentimes uh, the people that are, are trying to uh, destroy organizing and keep people divided uh, they use issues like gay marriage and uh, women's right to reproductive rights, the right to abortion. And I want to give you some language so they could say, take this back to your families and friends that you know that may be confused on this issue. And uh, we know a lot of that confusion comes from our religious organizations like the Catholic Church and some evangelical churches also. But we do have to tell them you know, these are human rights. A woman. Every woman has the human right to decide how many children she's going to have or not have. As you may know, I have 11 children. My daughters have one, two, three, and zero. <laughs> My daughter Juanita, who was a former teacher, decided she likes dogs better than kids, okay? And that is her human right. So we have to constantly remind people of that. And a woman has the right to abortion. She has the right to control her own body. And uh, there is a Mexican president called, his name was Benito Juarez, the first indigenous president of Mexico. And uh, he had a really famous saying that I think everybody in Mexico knows. And I think people in maybe in other countries. And the word, uh, the saying is this, respecting other people's rights is peace. El respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz. So how many uh, children a woman chooses to have? That is her human right. If someone wants to marry, live with, or love a person of the same sex, that is their human right. This does not affect you or your family. That is their human right. And we have to, again, be missionaries, bring up the conversation because we have to eliminate uh, the ignorance when it comes to those issues, you know, so that people will understand that we have to respect each other in spite of our differences in, in, of our skin or the way that we live. That is so, so important. There's one other issue I wanna mention because we have heard a lot about people at the border, uh, children, unaccompanied children that are showing up and we often ask, well, why are they coming here? Well, we know that they're escaping poverty, they're escaping terror. And what is the United States, what can we do about it? Well, one of the things that we can do about it, just even as consumers, when I say the word bananas, do we think of those countries like Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, where the children are coming from? No, we usually don't. But just think of all of the bananas that are consumed every single day in the United States. That is a lot, a lot of money, but that money does not go to the people in Guatemala or El Salvador or Honduras. It goes to Dole banana, it goes to Chiquita banana. It goes to the American banana companies. It doesn't go where the bananas are produced or the people that do the work to produce them or on whose land the bananas are produced. So these are things that we, have to be able to change. And how do we do that? The way that we change everything else 
is by voting, by registering to vote, by doing advocacy, advocacy and then electing progressive uh, representatives in our state legislature and especially in our US Congress that are going to fight not only for our rights, for the, for the rights of other people on our planet, okay? Because we are a global community. You know, what we do here affects people in, in other parts of the world. <clears throat> and <clears throat> but the one thing that we do have to know is that we have the power to change all of the things that are wrong. And, and we have to work together. I know that our topic is uh, weaving movements together. And that is the way that we make the changes because one thing that we do have to know is that one person cannot do it alone. We have to invite other people to join our movement. One organization can't do it alone. We have to form coalitions and work with other groups. And this is the way that we move forward. And sometimes with other groups, we may not always be on the same page. Uh, when we work uh, with the Catholic Church, we're together on immigration. We're not together on the issue of women's reproductive rights or gay rights, but that's okay. We can still work together on, on, immig on immigration and then work with our other partners uh, when we have to work on the other issues of uh, gay rights or, or, or women's reproductive rights. So, but we know, we know the formula. We know the formula. The formula is this. We have to form organization and, and sometimes if somebody, someone might think, well, that's kind of hard to do. Well, it really isn't. The way that Cesar Chavez and myself and many other organizers were taught by our great mentor, Fred Ross Sr. If you don't know who he is, he was such a great organizer that people don't know who he is, okay? Because he believed in empowering other people, not empowering himself. And he taught us that the way to organize is just get a few people together, talk about the issues, talk about the solutions, give examples of how similar issues have been solved in other areas, and then get people to commit to join the movement, okay? So we can make it happen. We can erase the apathy that people have, give them the courage that they need, show them how easy it is for them to go forward. And uh, there is, of course, I mentioned the Equal Rights Amendment, which is uh, in the Senate right now. And there's a website on that if people want to jot this down. The website is eraes2021.org. I'll repeat that, eraes2021.org. So you can go to that website and find out exactly where that law is at right now, what we have to do in sending those letters. Uh, we have, of course, uh, for the People Act, and this is the one this is a very important law right now in the Congress. It's also in the Senate. It's S1 is the number, Senate Bill 1. And that is to stop the voter suppression, all of these laws that they are passing in other states uh, to keep a people of color specifically and low income people from voting. And then of course, it's immigration reform. And that is gonna be a tough one. So we know our two senators from California, Diane Feinstein and Alex Padilla, we know that they're going to vote for that law. But if you know, have friends or family in other states, contact them, contact them, and ask them to please contact your, your US senator and ask them to vote for immigration reform, the Equal Rights Amendment, and People for the Power Act. Okay, that's one. That's the number of that one there. You know, Michael Moore and his show on Broadway, uh, he had this, he had this a little part. He said, Look, when we wake up in the morning, we wash our face, we brush our teeth, and then we call our congresswoman, okay? Or our congresswoman. So if we can get all of the students to remember that. And I think it's a good discipline to instill in ourselves because we have to advocate and we have to participate because this is what democracy is. So if we wanna equate democracy, we can equate democracy with organizing, with advocacy, you know, so we, that this, these are kind of like the, you might say the foundations of our democracy. And if democracy, is, as many have said, is more like an idea. And we saw that our democracy was attacked on, uh, our democracy was attacked on January the 6th. And I'm sure that that was very scary uh, for everybody. So we have to do whatever we can do uh, to make sure 
that our democracy is protected. So we've got to be the defenders, the active defenders of our democracy. And I know many of you um, know Dr. Kapoor, who is a teacher uh, there at Fresno State College. And, and uh, Dr. Kapoor, you know, one of the things that he advocates, of course, is nonviolence. And so we can think of everything we, that we do, even when violence is directed towards us, that we can win as long as we continue to organize in a peaceful way, as, as Dr. Kapoor has taught us. So I want to thank you very much, and I'm sure folks have questions. And by the way, I want to say, uh, for those in the audience, please feel free to challenge me. If you don't agree with anything that I said, I would also like to hear your opinion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dolores. Um, if there's any questions, I'm going to open up the chat. Feel, please feel free to, to put them in the chat. Um, one of the questions that has come to me is, if you are looking to, to organize locally, what would be your best advice? Well, uh, I would say, uh, think about uh, what, what your goal is, what you want to, uh, you know, what, what, what is it that you want to achieve, uh, then get somebody to help you. You know, get to get somebody so you won't do it alone. I mean, Cesar Chavez was a great organizer, uh, but he said to me, uh, Dolores, we have to form a union. And uh, even as great an organizer as he was, he asked me uh, to, to join with him in that effort. And, uh, and, and by the way, if the first person that you, that you approach uh, doesn't want to join you, then find somebody else. And you will find someone that has the same ideals as you do, that believes in your particular mission. I always like to say that even Jesus Christ, you know, had to go out there and get uh, uh, 12 disciples to help him, okay? Yeah, so we have another question in the chat. What are you most proud of? Oh, well, I think of, of the achievements, uh, uh, I think the amnesty bill of 1986, uh, uh, because uh, so many people got their amnesty during that time, they got the legalization in the, to the United States. And by the way, that bill was, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy was the moving force behind that amnesty bill. A lot of people give credit to Ronald Reagan, but all he did was sign the bill because we passed it in the Congress, okay? Uh, then I think when I think of farm workers today, some of them because they were with the United Farm Workers uh, and they, they get a pension, those that are retired. And to think that farm workers getting pensions, I mean, that is so awesome because we know uh, farm workers work so hard that sometimes their uh, bodies are wasted. And I, I just, uh, I, I, when I think of uh, the things that uh, I have been able to work on, and of course, I didn't do this all by myself. There were many people, as you know, in the United Farm Workers, we had five martyrs, people that were killed. One of them from Fresno County, uh, Rene Lopez, uh, who was very young, and he was killed because he organized his company to vote for the union. So um, I think it just uh, thinking about how many people we have been able to organize, how many people have become leaders. In fact, you may know that the Attorney General of the United States, I mean, the Attorney General of California, who has just been appointed Filipino, the first Filipino uh, to hold a statewide office in California, his name is Rob Bonta, and his family were part of the farm workers movement. And they actually lived at the headquarters of the union uh, with Cesar Chavez and his family. And that the leadership that comes out of organizing, I think, is something that always makes me proud when you see uh, one, another person from Fresno County, actually, uh, his family was in the movement, and he is now a judge in Kern County, Marcos Camacho. I know Ma Magdalena knows, so maybe other pe pe people might know that family. Sorry, we do have another question in the chat, how do we bring up issues like these with people that are quote unquote stuck in their ways? Well, that's why I, I said before, it's, it's a difficult conversation, but I always think uh, it's important to bring them up. In fact, I had a friend of mine that just uh, had a conversation with her just this morning and she called me to thank me. And I asked her, why are you thanking me? And she said, because I, always was always afraid of uh, African Americans. And uh, she said she happened to she said, she said I happened to mention it to you and you 
really educated me on that that was so wrong and uh, made me understand that that was racism. And I never realized that because that's the way that I had been brought up. And so you never know, I, you know, I have a saying, I think some of you have seen it, um, that every moment is an organizing moment, right? So when you are with somebody, and, and by the way, they may not be ready to hear your message the first time, but you can plant that seed, plant that seed, you know? And uh, sometimes you'll have to come back to them later until they're ready to accept the message. And the same thing goes when you're trying to organize people. At that moment, they may not ready, be ready to, to hear your message. But the main thing is not to get angry at them. We have to have a lot of patience because we know that their ignorance uh, and, and their biases come from their families or their culture. And so it just, again, think of them as having that sickness of racism or homophobia or sexism, and that we have to be the healers. So like the doctor, he doesn't slap you around, right, when you're sick. <laughs> so we just have to have that patience and, and just plant those seeds with them, you know, as much as you can. And eventually that little seed will grow, it will grow and uh, they will, because they'll hear, you know, the same message from other sources. And uh, we, we can turn people around. As my friend, which I, I had no idea, I couldn't even remember when this conversation took place because it was it had to be like 40 years ago. But she called me to thank me. Today, <laughs> all, all days. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. We have quite a few questions. Uh, I'm just going to go down the list. Some are sent directly to me. Some are um, are to the group. So I will just go in chronological order. Um, going to the next question, how important and integral were Fresno State University students to the UFW in the early days? Well, I have to confess that not very. <laughs> in fact, uh, it was interesting because uh, Cesar and I uh, were invited uh, to colleges all over the United States. You know, we spoke at Harvard, we spoke at Yale. Uh, you know, may, all, we, we were always invited to speak at uh, colleges. And I remarked this to someone, the places that I have spoken the least is in Fresno because we had, unfortunately, a lot of the educators that were very biased. And, you had, and then you had the trustees of the colleges you know, of Fresno State, Bakersfield State, you know, uh, be, that were very, very biased. And, and the, because the growers uh, the, sit on all of these uh, uh, trustees boards also. And I think many, many educators were probably um, hesitant uh, to invite us to speak because they would might get some kind of uh, retribution from, from the trustees. So, but I know that that is not the same anymore. I know that uh, at Fresno State, uh, 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 Danny Valdez uh, was a, a teacher there. And uh, since then, I have, uh, I would say that in the last um, maybe 10, 15 years that I have uh, been invited uh, many times to come to, uh, to speak at Fresno State College and, and the City College also. And they actually showed my movie at the city. Uh, there's an, a, a documentary that was made about my work with the farm workers. I recommend it. Uh, the document, documentary is called uh, Dolores. It's really easy to find. It's on YouTube or on the public broadcasting um, and the independent lens. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have, we do have another question. What, if any, tensions between your political beliefs and your stances on women's rights and your culture did you feel as you participated in the movement? Yes, and that tension still exists, uh, unfortunately, uh, as I mentioned before, because we ha have a lot of um, Latinos that are Catholics or evangelicals, and uh, not only not only Latinos but others, and uh, they. They confuse a religion with politics, which we know they should be separated. And oftentimes people vote against their self-interest uh, because of their biases. And, and I have a little story to tell on that one too. We get the Dolores Huerta Foundation, we do a lot of grassroots organizing. And, uh, and we started organizing in Lamont, California. And we, we were going to be doing a, a march uh, to get an increase in wages for the farm workers. The local priest, because he knew that we are a pro-abortion told the people in mass not to go to our march. That if they wanted to see an increase in wages, they should come to mass and pray to God to get an increase in wages. Well, once our women 
which by the way, we also had to kind of turn them around on the issue. They finally organized the priest and um, he had a mass for me on my birthday. <laughs> so, so people can be, uh, they can be changed on this issue if, if we address the issue as a human right. And I think that's the important thing. And again, it, it's not, these are not mandates, but they are, but people can, uh, have to, can choose what they want for their own life, but that they shouldn't expect other people uh, to have to accept uh, their beliefs, right? Everybody can believe what they want and do what they want for their own family. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, I am going to read uh, one thing here from one of our participants, um, uh, just some words of encouragement. Um, and so I'm going to read this and kind of sandwich it between the questions. So that way it's not all questions coming at you all at once. Um, Carmen Alessandro said, as a union leader sitting on the board of, uh, of directors for the largest classified staff in our country, the CSEA, I mm -hmm. want to thank you for your words and how important unions are to ensure good working conditions and fair wages for workers. She says, mucho gracias, señor Huerta. So um, I, I just want to, again, read, so there are some in the chat, some, some um, very powerful words of encouragement and, and thank you in there as, as well. So um, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next question. Do you have words of advice or words of encouragement for a new professional wanting to step into their Latina dad within their new role? Well, uh, th there's no uh, lack of issues, as we know. Uh, the main thing that we have to do, I think when we take on a professional roles that we continue to think of ourselves also as, as educators and uh, be able to tell our stories that we don't, uh, can't assume that other people in our profession uh, know the things that I've been talking about, uh, the history of discrimination uh, against people of color in this. So use whatever moments that we have to continue to be like the missionaries that I spoke about. And I also want to say to the women out there, I like to include this in my talk uh, to the women out there that uh, uh, no, knowing uh, the continuing discrimination against women and that women are not uh, being paid equally or given the equal opportunities. So I just like to say to the women, if there is a position out there that you aspire to or a job that you would like to have, and then you think, well, I just don't have the education or the experience, just do it like the guys do. Pretend that you do and learn on the job, okay? Pretend that you do and learn on the job. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for those, those words of advice for sure. Um, another question, could you describe how you met Cesar Chavez? How old were you? Did you keep working all through your parenting years? And how did your children respond and participate? Uh, well, you know, my mother, uh, because she divorced my father because he was abusive, uh, she worked two jobs. She worked in the daytime as a waitress and the nighttime in the cannery until she was able to save enough money to have her own business. And uh, we were often in the care of other people because my mother had to work two jobs. And I guess I kind of continued that tradition uh, because I always worked. I always had to find people to help me with my kids. Uh, it wasn't easy on my kids, the ones that really, uh, you might say, uh, sacrificed the most, especially when we went to work. I went to work with United Farm Workers because we didn't have any money. You know, we, we were not paid. Uh, we only had uh, a stipend of $10 a week. All of our expenses were paid, like our, our gasoline, our automobiles were provided. Uh, medical expenses were all taken care of by the union, but we didn't have any ready cash. And so this is, a, this is how my children grew up. But uh, the thing is about it, it made them very resourceful. It made them very independent. They, they knew that they couldn't depend on me. Uh, and I had to reach out to very many, to everybody to help me with my children. First, my mother, then my aunts and cousins and farm workers, anybody. And of course, in the United Farm Workers, we also set up daycare centers for, for the children. So uh, this is just a lifestyle. But one of the, this is one of the things I didn't mention, but we do have to, as women, and of course, men, a fight for universal childcare for our children because we know that women's voices are needed. I like to say, if, there, if there's a board somewhere making a, an important decision, make sure that we have to make sure that we have equal numbers of feminists on that board. Uh, women, of course, and men that think that support women's rights, we have to have equal numbers of women and feminists on that board, okay? If not, they're gonna make the wrong decisions. So 
this is why we have to, you know, Coretta Scott King said that we will never, never have power. We will never have power. I mean, excuse me, we will never have peace. I'm sorry, I got that backwards. We will never have peace until women take power. We will never have peace until women take power. Uh, so that's really important. And of course, uh, if women are relegated to just be the housewives and take care of the home and they, they can never get out into public life to hear their voices heard. And, and then we really can't progress in, in our society. And we have seen what awesome women can do like the speaker Nancy Pelosi of our country. Now we have our vice president Kamala Harris. And we, while we still don't have equal numbers of women in our legislature and in our Congress, we can say that we are getting there. We're not there yet. Thank you so much for your, for your answer. We do have another question from a student. Um, she asked, what is your honest opinion about cancel culture? What advice would do you give to people that are afraid of being quote unquote canceled? Well, I think this is kind of a tricky word. And I think uh, that uh, the opponents are using that a lot. Um, I think there's a lot of things that, well, I think there's some things that we would like to see canceled, like the things we've been talking about, racism, misogyny, <laughs> homophobia, yeah, uh, inequalities that we have in education and in people's incomes. Uh, we would like to see that. And I wouldn't call it cancel. I think we want to have it changed, you know? So those are kind of some of those little tricky words that they uh, use out there because they're trying to demean the fact that we have uh, blatant sexism in our society that the girls are being human trafficked, you know, uh, that, and, 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 and I just want to, I haven't mentioned it, but it's really, really important. Uh, again, to end the racism that we have, and we have to do it, I mentioned through our educational system, but we know that in the Central Valley of California, where you're located there in Fresno County, I'm here in Kern County, uh, and then we have in between Tulare County, you know, 40% of our school districts in the, um, let, let me put it the other way, the, the push outs that we have of our children, the expulsions and suspensions that we have of our children of color are higher in the Central Valley of California than in the whole state. And 40% of those, can you imagine the whole state of California with a big population that we have in California, 40% of those school districts are the, are the ones that have the highest number of expulsion. So we have a huge, problem in education in stopping the school to prison pipeline. Uh, not only in the Valley, we have it uh, throughout the state of California in other states also, Arizona, Texas, you know, even in New York state and all of these places that I have visited, uh, we have a very in inequitable system of education. And uh, this is one of the things that our foundation is uh, trying to address. We're active in 14 different school districts and every chapter of our organization that we organize, we have an education committee so that we can uh, teach the parents and the students how they can fight the system, how they can go to the school board meetings, how we can use the local control funding formula and the ALCAPs uh, to be able to make recommendations uh, to the school districts and reduce the amount of money that they are spending on the police on campuses and put that money more to social workers, consultants, and also changing the makeup of our teachers. And I don't know what the statistics are for Fresno, but in the Kern High School District, which we sued because they expelled 2000 students of color in one year, 2000 students of color in one year. After our lawsuit, that has been reduced from 2000 to 21 but they still have not met with all of the demands of the lawsuit. You still have 82% of the teachers that are Anglo and the other, of course, are people of color, but 70% of the students are children of color. And I think that the same thing probably exists throughout the Central Valley. And in our Kern High School District, when they hire teachers, they don't go to Los Angeles or San Jose or, or even here in Kern County to Bakersfield College or State College they go to the Midwest and they hire Anglo teachers. And so many of those teachers already come with the implicit bias. So, uh, you know, we're still working on that. Uh, we're going to be, me, this lawsuit was filed several years ago. They were supposed to have uh, a, a Black History Month, uh, a, a Hispanic Heritage Month, 
like, just to give the kids in the school district some dignity and, you know, and know about, you know, what their, what their ancestors did to build the United States of America, because that never happened. But we're still working on it. And I think that's, and I invite everybody here uh, to please do the same. You know, if I, I had the good fortune to grow up in Stockton, California, which is very integrated, in a very integrated neighborhood. It was all a uh, working people neighborhood. So my neighbors were, were Italians and Greeks and, and, uh, and African-Americans and Japanese and Chinese and Filipino. So I was so fortunate. And a lot of people don't know this, but Stockton, California had the first Hindu, I guess, uh, temple in the whole United States of America. And there were meetings, and I didn't find out this out till afterwards, but it makes me so proud because I, you know, we used to walk by that temple every single day <laughs> on our way to our local swimming pool, that there were meetings there to plan the independence of India. Who knew that? Oh my gosh, you know. So we can think of, uh, we have a lot to be proud of. And, you know, we have to remind people too that here in the Central Valley of California, and I should say the San Joaquin Valley of California, this is one of the four or five regions in the whole world where we have the Mediterranean climate. And that's why we can grow all of this great food. You know, so we are very, very special here where we live. Unfortunately, that doesn't come down to the people that work, right? To the people that work in the fields, uh, because for so many years uh, they were disrespected and denigrated. And we see that changing now uh, in terms of respect and recognition that they are now being considered essential workers. And there's going to be a farm worker day. I think they're trying to pass a bill in uh, state legislation now for, farm worker, for a farm worker day. We have a Cesar Chavez holiday, as we know, which is coming up. Uh, I have a day of recognition, and so does uh, my, my good friend, uh, Larry Edlong. Uh, they named the day of recognition for him, but now we're gonna have a farm worker, a special farm worker day also, uh, to start really giving our, our farm workers the recognition that they deserve. Thank you so much. And that actually segues into our next question. Um, what was your experience like working with Filipino American farmers like Larry Edlong during the farm workers movement? Well, I actually recruited Larry Eatleong because <laughs> Larry Eatleong is also from Stockton. And before Sesson and I formed uh, the United Farm Workers, I had formed an organization of farm workers called AWA, Agricultural Workers Association. And when I was uh, organizing uh, that group, I, I needed a Filipino organizer. I had an Oki organizer, a Latino organizer, I had a black organizer, but I needed to find a Filipino organizer to help me. and. Uh, so every, every, all of my Filipino friends that I would speak to, there's this guy named Larry Eatleong, you know, they all gave me the same name. So I, I finally tracked him down and I had a meeting with him at his house with him and his wife. And I told him that what we were doing and he jumped in. And uh, so we became uh, lifelong friends. And then of course that organization all was taken over by the uh, AFL-CIO, um, AFL at that time. And uh, it became Agricultural Works Organizing Committee. And of course, then Larry became the head of that. I actually was the executive secretary of that group and I hired Larry to work uh, with that group. So I'm kind of like they say in Spanish, his madrina or his godmother. But, but the Filipinos and Mexicans always uh, pretty much live in the same communities. And uh, in, in the fields, the growers will, would always have them uh, the Mexican crews and the Filipino crews uh, separated. But once we got, we, once we uh, signed the union contracts, that's one of the things that we did, we integrated. Uh, we integrated uh, the Filipinos and the Mexicans to work together. And a lot of marriages came out of that integration. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I'm gonna get to just one last question here um, from one of our students. I think, what is your take on the American Dream and Promise Act under President Biden's uh, term he is trying to get through? Well, uh, we definitely, we know that right now he's uh, made a head on executive action uh, so that the dreamers can stay here and also people with temporary protective status, but that's gonna be part of the Immigration Reform Act. And as I said before, we really gotta do a lot of work to make that happen. 
because we know that the Senate is, is e even Stephen right now, you got the same number of Democrats, same number of Republicans. And of course, our Vice President Kamala Harris will be the tying. But uh, so we have to do a lot, a lot of work because they, unfortunately, the attack on immigrants has been a part of the conservative, uh, you know, division that they try to keep us divided. So again, if we know people in other states, uh, call them, ask them, uh, as Michael Moore said, call. Call their, call their senator, call their congressman to pass these important laws. And undocumented people, you know, like our farm workers, they deserve to have their legal status in this country because they're doing all of the hard work uh, to keep our society uh, you know, moving and uh, taking care of us. They're feeding us, taking care of our children, taking care of our elders, cleaning our buildings, building our buildings, doing all of the heavy lifting. And they deserve to be given legal status. And by the way, this is nothing new. As I said before, all of the European immigrants that came to the uh, United States, you know, they didn't need a green card when they got here. They, but eventually, every immigrant group uh, uh, became a, a, a legal resident and, and a citizen. And so uh, th this pushback that we are hearing now, that we've been hearing now for the last uh, uh, maybe 30 years now, it's aimed at people of color. I mean, we are a big country. We can absorb a lot of people. And then the other thing that we have to do, as I mentioned before, when I was talking about the bananas, help other countries uh, do their own economic development, you know, so that people, they leave their, their, these beautiful places that they leave, like, uh, like uh, Chiapas, you know, in Guatemala, and these people go there as tourists, but they have to, they leave, leaves their native lands because they have no way to be able to, to survive. And we could change that. And we can think about all of the money that we have spent on wars in Vietnam, you know, in the Middle East, you know, all of the billions of dollars that we have spent, instead of using that money for war, if we would, if we would have used that money uh, to, you know, help these other countries develop their economies. So we have to have a whole different mindset and stop this idea of competition and conquer and that the resources of other countries belong to us. I remember before the war in Iraq, one person had a sign and said, how did our oil get under their sand? How did our oil get under their sand? So we are the richest country in the world and there is no reason that we have to exploit other countries, you know, for you know, for our own wealth. Oh, and, and I forgot to mention something very, very important is that one of our goals has to be that yes, we have free tuition at all of our universities in the United States of America, and that we have free healthcare also, like they have in Scandinavia, like they have in some Latin American countries, like they have in Cuba which is a country that has an economic boycott by the United States, but every single person in Cuba has free healthcare and a free university education and free culture, by the way. I think we have many people, our poor people, they've never been to a Broadway play. You know, they've never been to an opera. They probably couldn't even afford the ticket, you know? So we have to change this idea that we have this caste system, that we have the very rich and that 10% of the corporations and the wealthy families like Walmart, that they own 90% of the wealth. This is wrong and we have to change it. And people in the audience, you are the ones that are going to do it. Yes, we can. How about a big virtual round of applause for Senora Huerta? Thank you, thank you so much. And, and if I if I, could just, if I could just end with this, uh, one thing I always love, love to end all of my talks with is to remind people, and I have a couple of questions that I like to ask people, and I don't know if some people can unmute themselves so we can make this happen, but my question is a very simple one. I ask, who's got the power? And you need to say, we've got the power. And I ask, <laughs> what kind of power? And you say, people power. power. Yeah. Can, can we do that? Can we do that? We can certainly try. Okay. All right. We're going to officially unmute. Power. 
it, you might um, hear some feedback, folks. So let's just make it happen. <laughs> so we will turn it over to you, Senora Huerta. Go ahead and lead, lead our chant here. Oh, thank you. All right. Who's got the power? We, we got, got, got the power. power. What kind of power? People, People power. power. Okay, so are we going to go forward, work together, build our coalitions, you know, dedicate ourselves, organize others to help us uh, so that we can finally make a progressive society in our dear United States of America? Okay, si se puede. Let's all do it together. Si se puede. Si se puede. Si se well, I hope all of you have taken away a lot of knowledge from, from this presentation. Um, Patrick, we might need to mute folks now. Thank you for attending. Oops, there we go. Thank you for attending. Our goal is also going to be that as soon as we get this um, recording up, we will share it with everyone. So if students or others weren't able to attend, we can make that available. Again, I cannot tell you what an honor it is um, just to have you in our presence, even if it's virtual. We promise to have you back um, in person because we will get that Smithsonian exhibit here somehow, some way, make it happen. And um, I hope we walked away with um, that we're all relatives, we are one race. Um, so make sure you reach out and you tell someone that. Uh, we're gonna make sure we gap capture that quote uh, by Dolores Huerta and, and put that out there. And I don't know, but you gotta love the one, act like a man and learn on the job, ladies. Come on, make it happen. All right, I'll stop before I really go off on that one. But I love that one. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Have a Thank wonderful you. Thank afternoon. you so much for being here. This was wonderful. Have a good afternoon, everybody.